All right, so last time we talked about a lot, but this time we're going to talk about even more, so much so that I expect we'll spill over a little bit into Monday, but that's okay. So last time our focus was limits, and it's going to be limits again today with various other things we're going to be focusing on. So we have this notation limit as x approaches c, g of x equals l, which is essentially another way to read this statement. So mathematics, they like to pass some compact notation. And the idea about limits are, well, we might have this function g of x, and at x equals c, we don't know what it, what's happening. We might have something like a 0 over 0, which is what's happening when we were trying to find that tangent line. So we don't know what is happening. So what the limits do is they say, well, okay, we don't know what happens, but we can tell you what should happen. And we, the way we do it is we, we tell you what should happen based upon what is happening nearby. So you look at the function g of x near values close to c. And you look at it nearer and nearer and nearer. You say, okay, based upon what I see these values doing, I can say that you should get this value l. And I should point out that l is a single fixed number. You can't approach two different numbers simultaneously. So this will become in handy when we talk about derivatives. One other thing we talked about are one side limits. Here, where I just have this notation, x approaches c, it could come from the left or the right, either way. So I need to account for both directions. I can just say, well, what happens if I just come from the left-hand side or from below? And to denote that, I put a minus sign after the c. So it's not a typo if you see, like, x approaches 1 minus, you're thinking, oh, they made a mistake. It's supposed to be x approaches negative 1. No, it just means you come from the left of 1. Similarly, we can come from the right or above, and that's denoted by a plus sign, x approaches c plus of g of x. Again, that just means we only care about what happens for values above c. So when we are determining what we should get, we don't care about what happens below. So we saw an example for the function absolute value over x. If you remember that graph, it looked like this. And that when we came from above or from the right, we got a value of 1. We came from below, the left, we got a value of negative 1 for the limits. And the limit, then, did not exist. In order for the limit to exist, you have to get the same answer regardless of what direction you come from. So if these are not the same, the limit does not exist. And we also saw examples where limits don't exist. Uh, we also talked about infinite limits, but that's not too important. We won't see those very often. And the moral of our story is just remember that limits do what they think they should do. So if I have a constant k, and I look at the limit as x approaches c of that constant, it's the constant, no surprise. If I have the function x, and I say, well, what's the limit as x approaches c of x? If I go back to the definition of limit, which I didn't write, it involves epsilon to deltas, but it basically says, so what is x getting close to as x gets close to c? Well, as x gets close to c, x gets close to c. So that's a very fancy way of saying that statement, not very profound. And then what we can do is we, if we have limits, they exist. So if I have two functions, f of x approaches L and g of x approaches M, and they're both approaching at the same point, C, as x goes to C. Well, then what I can do is I can basically combine them in different ways, and I get what I expect to get. So in other words, if I look at f of x plus g of x, I really can just take the limits separately. So in other words, if, if f is getting close to L and g is getting close to M, f plus g is getting close to L plus M. No surprise. If I have a constant times f of x, I can pull the constant out. So the limit of a constant times f of x is the same as the constant times the limit. If I have a product, as long as the, each limit exists individually, then I can just say take the limit of each piece. And as long as the denominator won't go to 0. So if g of x goes to 0, I can't do this. But if g of x doesn't go to 0, if it avoids 0, then I can say if I have a ratio, f of x over g of x, I just take the limit of the ratio, sorry, the ratio of the limits. Okay, so limits do pretty much what we expect them to do. And once we have these rules, once we know what happens to constants, once we know what happens to x, and once we have these basic rules for combining, it's very easy to see that if I have a polynomial. So polynomials are things like x cubed minus 2x squared plus 1, just some combination of powers of x. If I have a polynomial, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. And it's nothing more than combining all the rules that you see here on the board. All right, so that's what we did last time. Are there any questions before we jump into what we do this time? 
Okay, good. No questions. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, first thing we're going to talk about today is continuity. And the way to think about continuity is no breaks. Now, depending upon where you learned where about continuous functions from when you were in algebra or perhaps in calculus, another definition you may have heard of is you can draw it without lifting the pencil. So you have a function, as long as you can draw in sort of one continuous line, aha, that's the word continuous, then it's a continuous function. But if you have to lift your pencil at some point, then it's not a continuous function. So what is the definition of, of continuity? Well, why would we have to lift our pencil? What are some things that could go bad? Well, some things that could go bad, actually, let me draw it over here so I can mark it up in a minute. I might have, for example, that sine 1 over x function might be doing something here. And then, remember, this one doesn't exist because it's not going to anything. So I'm undefined at 0. So I'm lifting my pencil up. Then after 0, I come into here. And I come down. And then I put a hole here. And I have to jump up and mark this point because somehow at this special value, I, I'm leaving a hole in. I come along here. I jump up here. Keep going. So where, where do I have discontinuities? Well, discontinuities, I'm fine here because I can keep drawing. Then when I come to zero, I'm, I'm not fine because I have to lift my pencil off. I come here. Again, I have to lift my pencil off. Come here. Aha, I have to move my pencil again. So these points here are discontinuities. And what do we notice about these points? Well, if we think about what we were talking about for limits, these are also examples where we saw weird things happening with the limits. So, for example, what happens at this point here? Well, if you think about the limit, the limit says that what we should get is this value here. But that's not what the function tells us. The function tells us that we get this value here. So somehow there's this disconnect between what the limits say and what the function actually says should happen. And that's what continuity really boils down to. So a function... f of x is continuous at a point if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to the value of the function at the point c. Or the way I like to think about this is what we expect, because that's what the limit tells us. The limit tells us what should we expect to happen is equal to what we get. So there's no surprise. There's really three things that have to happen, though. If you really break down what's going on, three things need to happen. One, this limit has to exist. Two, the function has to be defined. Or if you like, it also exists. So in other words, it's not an undefined point. The last thing is that they have to be equal. So the continuity at a point requires those three things to occur. The limit has to exist, the function has to be defined at that point, and it's, the two values there are both equal. All right, so here's an example of a function where we have some discontinuities. Well, let's say I look over here at this piece for a second, and I wanted to look at this particular point here. Is the function continuous at that point, just by, based on the picture? And my apologies to people who listen to the audio podcast, because based on the picture, it's not very descriptive when you're running on the treadmill. OK. Just imagine. Aha, uh -huh, there's an interesting curve here. OK. Well, it's continuous, because if I think about, based on the picture here, what do I expect to happen? Well, I'm coming from below. I expect to go to this value. When I come from above, I expect to go to this value. And lo and behold, the function there is that value. So the function is continuous. So essentially, when you see an unbroken line, you know it's continuous. OK, how about at this value here? Is the function continuous? No. Why not? What rule am I breaking?
I'm, I'm breaking this rule, the limit doesn't exist. And I'm breaking this rule, and I'm breaking this rule. Really, I'm, it's the worst possible kind of discontinuity. In fact, this is such a bad discontinuity, the book doesn't even give it a name. So we'll just mark a name here. It's a very sad discontinuity. Okay. All right. Now let's come over to here. Again, now I have a place where I'm discontinuous. What rule am I breaking? Now, the, the limit exists. That's good. The function is defined. That's good. It's the equality that's the problem. The function that we get when we plug the point in C doesn't match what we think we should get. So the, the way that they draw this is they actually draw this with the hole. And this actually has a, a special type of name. This is called a removable discontinuity. Now, the reason we call it a removable discontinuity is we can remove it by just tweaking the function. And in particular, all we have to do is we have to take that point there, because our problem is that the value of the function is just in the wrong place. If we can just move it down here, lo and behold, our discontinuity no longer exists. Our function is now continuous at that point. So if we can just redefine the function at that single point, it's called a removable discontinuity. And essentially, the picture is the following. It's just, there's a hole in the line. Okay, now let's come over to here. Well, now we have that the function is defined, but the limit doesn't exist. The problem of here is that the limit exists if I look from the left, and the limit exists if I look from the right, but they don't match up. So this also has a name. This is called a jump discontinuity. So this is when the limit as x approaches c from below does not equal the limit as x approaches c from above. But these limits exist. I should say removable discontinuity is that basically f of c does not exist. Well, the limit exists. And either f of c is not defined, which is possible, for example, at sine x over x, we just didn't define what sine 0 over 0 is. But we can define what sine 0 over 0 is to make it continuous. Or f of c is not equal to the limit. So that's a removable discontinuity. Here's a jump discontinuity. The two, two one-sided limits exist. But well, they don't match. There is one other kind of discontinuity that the book talks about, which is not too important, and it's this kind. So here we have a discontinuity because our function essentially blows up. So this kind of discontinuity is called an infinite discontinuity. I apologize for my handwriting. And that happens when you have a limit as x approaches c either from above, below, or just as is of f of x is plus or minus infinity. So, so when you have something blowing up, or in other words, you have a vertical asymptote, so the function blows up, that's an infinite discontinuity. And it doesn't have to be blowing up on both sides. You could blow up on one side, then it could be perfectly fine on the other side. I could blow up a, one side could blow up to plus infinity, one side could blow up to minus infinity. The point is, if you ever have anything blowing up to infinity where you have to have draw in a vertical asymptote, that's an infinite discontinuity. Now, don't worry too much about these definitions. Uh, you will not be quizzed on the definitions. I'm not going to test you on these definitions. I just want you to build up some sort of intuition about these. And especially, more importantly, it'll be good for your homework. Okay. So that are some basics about discontinuous things. And we know what a continuous function is, so we should make a list what are examples of continuous functions? Let's write ourselves some lists. OK, do we know any general examples of continuous functions? This is one of those 0, 1 are on the board. And in this case, actually, all answers are correct for 0, 1 are on the board. But I'm, thinking, I'm leaning more towards the on the board kind of response. Ah, oh, if only we had an example of continuous functions. Hmm. 
Uh, if only there was something that we knew which was continuous. I don't know. Any ideas? Polynomials. Oh, oh, that's right. Because remember what we talked about last time. We ha said that we have a function which is a polynomial that the limit as x approaches c of f of x is f of c. And look at this. It's exactly what we have down here. This is the definition of being continuous. So really what we said last time is just that polynomials are continuous. We just didn't say it that way. Okay, so we know polynomials are continuous. All right. So that's the try to read my mind one. I'll only mention some other ones. From trigonometry, you have sine is a continuous function. We'll talk more about that hopefully by the end of today. And cosine. Uh, tangent, is tangent a continuous function? No. But it's almost continuous. I mean, what's the problem with tangent? Well, the problem with tangent is you have these vertical asymptotes. So you can say tangent when you're away from your vertical asymptotes. So it is continuous as long as you stay away from those asymptotes. At those asymptotes, it, it's not continuous. They're kind of cheating a little bit there. Some other ones that you might have heard of, e to the x, really nice function. Uh, e is a really fun number, 2.71828. Unfortunately, we won't get to talk about that very much. Close related to e to the x, of course, is log x, as long as you're positive. You can't take log of negative numbers until you go on another year in math, and then you learn you can take log of negative numbers. We were lying to you the whole time. But for right now, you can't take logs of negative numbers. You have to take log of positive numbers. Uh, it's kind of sad. We will not talk about these functions in our class very much. We'll only mention them from time to time. It's a preview. Next quarter, you'll actually will learn about e to the x and log x. And it's kind of strange that you're saying, well, why don't we learn about them now? It's because the actual technical definition of log x in mathematics is involves integration, and we haven't learned integration yet. Uh, kind of weird, but that's, that's the way it is. You know, it's, it's actually kind of sad, because these are so cool. You can do so much with these functions. I'm sorry, I just get emotional. Okay, uh, one of my favorites that technically I shouldn't talk about this quarter, but I love it so much, I have to mention it at least a couple times. Arctangent. Arctangent is the inverse tangent function. And we'll, we'll talk about this function in, in a few weeks. I loved our tangent so much when I taught a summer course in calculus once. We had essentially a test every week at the end of the week. And our tangent was on every single test. Because it's, it's just there's so many cool things you can do with our tangent. All right. So these are some building blocks. Oh, I should mention one other kind of function. Polynomials. Well, polynomials, you take x to sort of even. Sorry, not even. But you take x to integral powers. But in fact, you can do other powers. You can do x to the alpha. And alpha can be any number you want. For, so for example, the square root of x. Now the only thing you have to be careful of is sometimes like square root of x is not defined everywhere, because you can't take square root of negative numbers. At least not in our class, you go on another year or two, you'll have to learn out, aha, I can't take square root of negative numbers. But for now, you can't. Um, so this is x to the alpha in its domain. So in other words, where it makes sense to say x to the alpha. So square root of x, x to the one third or cubed root of x. Of course, it doesn't even have to be nice numbers. You could say x to the pi. Pi is a number. 3.14159. Easy to remember pi. There's a chan that came from MIT. I always, you know, once you hear it once, you yeah, always remember it. Cosine, secant, tangent, sine, 3.14159. Right, right, right. <laughs> Easy to remember. You'll never forget it now. Okay. So what we have, are we have these continuous functions. Polynomials, sines, cosine, powers of x. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is combine them together. And lo and behold, we can do it very similarly to what we've done here, in that what we expect to happen almost always happens. So for instance, let's say that 
f of x and g of x are continuous at x equals c. So I have these continuous functions at x equals c. Then the following are also continuous. Namely, you have f of x plus g of x. Oh, I should say r also continuous at x equals c. So why is this true? Well, that's no more than what we have here. Because we know that this limit exists, we know that that limit exists, so this limit exists, and it is what it should be, therefore it's continuous. Well, so f of x plus g of x, I can also do k times f of x. Again, for any arbitrary constant, k. And one very special constant, of course, is negative 1. So for instance, if k is negative 1, this also says that f of x minus g of x. So if I add or if I take the difference. Because essentially I can replace, think of this as, if you like, think of this as f of x plus negative 1 times g of x. So I'm just combining those two rules. So you can add, you can subtract, same thing as over here. This rule tells us that f of x times g of x is continuous. And we have one other rule here, which looks at the ratio, but the ratio we have to be careful. We can't divide by zero. And so here we'll just put a little side note. If g of c is not zero, then also have f of x over g of x. So our rules for limits translate now into rules for continuous functions. So what this says is once you have continuous functions, you can combine them together. You can combine by addition. You can scale it. You can multiply. You can divide. And the only thing we have to worry about is the division. We can't divide by zero. So what we're learning is, is how to put functions together. There's one other kind of operation we can do for functions that we need to mention. And that is composition. OK. All right, let me, where is my piece of paper? I should number my pages so I can keep track of where I am. All right. So a composition function, so this is denoted by f circle g of x. And what this means, this is not fog. This is, this is a little teeny circle. I should draw it a little smaller. There we go. f circle g. You read this as f of g. And you can really add in f of g of x. What it means is you take your function, sorry, sorry not your function, your, your value x, and you plug it into g first, and then you take that and you plug it into f. So apply g, get whatever result you want, then apply f. It's kind of counterintuitive because you first, you, we read left to right, so you say, aha, f then g, but it's actually first do g, then do f. So this is composition of functions. So for example, if g of x is x squared plus 1, and f of x is sine of x, then f of g of x, well, first says, take x and do what g of x says to do. Well, g, g of x says to do x squared plus 1. So that's f of x squared plus 1. So now I'm plugging x squared plus 1 into my function. And my function says, whatever I plug in, take the sine of that. So that would be sine of x squared plus 1. So here's an example of, of composition of functions. All right. And what does we get for continuity here? We have the following. If g of x is continuous at x equals c, and f of x is continuous at x equals, any guesses? Uh, good guess. 
but it's g of c. Then f of g of x is continuous at x equals c. Now here, let's just think about what's happening. So I have f of g of x. So first off, the inside should be continuous in order for this to make sense. It doesn't have to be. You can, it's easy to construct examples. But we want to be guaranteed no matter what. So if the inside is continuous, I really want to make sure g is continuous at the point I'm interested in, and that's at x equals c. Now, what's happening to my inside as x gets close to c? If I look at the inside of the function f. The inside of the function f is g of x. So what is this approaching as x gets close to c? It's approaching g of c. So that's why I need to worry about whether f is continuous at g of c and not at, at c. It's a small thing, and you don't need to worry about the details, because we're not going to kill you on that. We'll kill you on something else. We'll pick something else to cream you on. <coughs> right. All right, so now what do we have? What we have are some basic functions, polynomials, powers of x, sine, cosine, things like tangent. You could also do secant. And these other functions that we really don't talk about. And we have ways to combine. Addition, scaling, multiplication, division, and composition. And essentially, that's what we're going to do. Is we, all the functions we're going to see take these kinds of functions here and uh, combine them in these kinds of ways. And that's it. It's our building blocks. Here are our building blocks. Here's our rules for putting them together. So every function that we can possibly imagine seeing in our course, although we can make functions which are much worse, will be composed of these building blocks. So for instance, what do we have? Well, suppose I ask you, is the following function continuous? OK, let's see if I can make a fun function. So I, I asked, is f of x equal to cosine of x cubed plus 1 divided by 2 minus sine x continuous? Now, the definition, I should say for all x, because I need to specify where. Now, according to the definition, we'd have to say, well, what we have to do is we have to look at the limits, and then we have to check, make sure that the limit matches with what the function says. That sounds hard and complicated. Let's skip all that. Let's think about how we can use our building blocks to just say, yeah, it's continuous. Well, here, we know 2 is a continuous function. It's a constant. Constants are continuous. Sine x is continuous. It's on our list. So 2 minus sine x is continuous. Similarly, x cubed plus 1, this is a polynomial, so we know that's continuous. Cosine is continuous everywhere, no problems. So the composition is continuous. So we know the top is continuous. We know the bottom is continuous. So the ratio is continuous as long as what? As long as the bottom is never 0. So we have to think about 2 minus sine x. Can 2 minus sine x ever be equal to 0? Now hopefully you should all be saying no automatically. If not, we're going to have to review sine x some more, which we might today. All right. But no, sine x only goes between the values of 1 and negative 1 in our class. There are other classes where it goes, does different things. But for us, sine x only goes between 1 and negative 1. So 2 minus sine x can never get to 0 because sine x is never 2. All right. So we know that then this ratio is continuous. And now we're done. So what we could do is we took our basic building box, we took our rules for building it, and so we know that each of our pieces are continuous. We've combined them together in continuous ways, so the resulting function is continuous. Now there's one thing that we can do which is kind of uh, a little bit different than this, and that is that we can look at a function, and we can look at a function in pieces. So let's try a different function. Suppose I ask the following question, is g of x, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to find it in several different cases. Let's say it's the function x squared, if x is less than or equal to 1, it's going to be 2x minus 1, if x is less than 1, but it's less than 3. And it's going to be 6 if x is greater than or equal to 3. 
So here what I've done is we have our continuous function and we've built it up. This is fine. Here I essentially say, well, look, I have some continuous functions, but now I'm going to you know, slice and dice. I'm going to cut them up into pieces. And I know that each one of my individual pieces is continuous. So I know x squared is a nice continuous function. I know 2x minus 1 is continuous. I know 6 is continuous. But now I'm going to combine them together. In particular, I'm going to look at x squared if x is less than or equal to 1. So let's see if we can draw ourselves a picture. So we have our x. So x squared looks something like this. It's a parabola. And we say g of x is x squared if x is less than or equal to 1. So here, let's say this is, say this is 1. So what that tells me is that if I come to this picture, g of x matches with x squared. So my function, if I'm just building up, it looks like x squared. So I'm going to take x squared and I'm going to stop at x equals 1. And because I have the less than or equal to, I'm going to actually put a little dot here. Now, between 1 and 3, my function is 2x minus 1, which is a line. And if I've, if I've done my math right in my head, it's a line that looks something like this. And then, so here, let's say this is 3. So it looks something like that. And then 6. Sorry, I'm sort of skipping. I'll come back and talk about it. Okay. So we have three functions. We have the x squared function, which does this. And then it would continue being x squared. But we don't care about what it does after 1. We only want it below 1. Then we have this line 2x minus 1, which keeps extending back and forth. And then we have 6, which is a constant. So here's 6. Now, when is this function continuous? Well, it's always going to be continuous inside these regions, because these are continuous functions. So for x less than 1, there's no problem with x squared. Between 1 and 3, 2x minus 1 is continuous. And bigger than 3, 6 is continuous. So each one of the pieces is continuous. So as far as continuity goes, what do I need to be worried about? So the only problem I need to worry about with continuity is where I glue. So I'm gluing here at 1. And I'm gluing here at 3. It's when I glue the two pieces together, the problem is they may or may not match. And how do you check continuity is you check to see if they match or if they don't. Now, I've, I've kind of drawn on the picture, so I've given away what's going to happen. Is it going to be continuous at 1? Well, what do you need to check? Yeah, it says we need to make sure there's no break. We need to make sure the limit exists and it matches with what the function says. We know that if I plug 1 in, I'm using this rule, so I should get 1 out. So the way I check is I say, OK, what happens below 1? It looks like x squared. So what should I expect to get at 1? 1. What happens above 1? I look like 2x minus 1. What would I expect to get at 1? 1. And how do we get those? We just plug them in. So essentially what you do is you plug the values in at the two endpoints, and you say, do they agree or not? You're just checking to see if the gluing matched up. OK, how about at 3? If I plug 3, well, OK. What below 3, I look like 2x minus 1. So what do I expect to get at 3? Well, at 3, I'd get 2 times 3 minus 1, which is 5. I expect to get 5 out at 3. Above 3, I look like 6. So I expect to get 6, because you know, it doesn't change. So what happens here is that 5 and 6 don't match which is why we have this di jump discontinuity here. But here, there's no discontinuity. Everything's fine. So like one of your problems will ask you, how do you select numbers to make sure that this function is continuous? The trick is, you just have to make sure that when you glue the two of them together, that there was no break. That they, basically, that they lined up just right to the limit exist and from both sides that's equal. Okay. So that's it for continuous functions. Let's go back. We need to start building up tools to evaluate limits. 
Now, the nice thing is, if we have continuous functions, it's really easy to evaluate limits. You basically just plug in the value of the limit you're interested in, and then as long as you don't get 0 over 0 or something like that, you're OK. So the real thing we have to start worrying about is how do we deal with limits that end up with things like 0 over 0. So this is, we'll call this algebraic manipulation of integrals. Oh, sorry, limits. All right. So the problem is that we might have an example of, let's say the limit as x, I just want to make sure I get these numbers right, x approaches 3 x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x squared plus x minus 12. Now, these limits, or sorry, this function is composed of a polynomial on the top and a polynomial on the bottom. So it's a continuous function on top, continuous function on the bottom. And so if we want to know what, what happens, well, we know it's a continuous function. So as long as when I plug in x equals 3 in the denominator, I don't get 0, I'm OK. So the first thing you should always try is, well, let's just plug it in. If you plug it in, you get a number out, you're done. You don't have to do anything else. So let's plug in a number, and let's see what we get. If I plug in 3 on the top, well, this is going to 9 minus 12 plus 3 divided by 9 plus 3 minus 12. Well, if you do some math here, 9 plus 3 is 12. Then I subtract 12, so that's 0. And 9 plus 3 is 12 again. And I again subtract 12, so I get 0. So I'm going to 0 over 0. And so now we're like, ah, oh, darn it. We were so close. If we hadn't gotten 0 over 0, we'd be done. Now we have to do more work. OK. So what's our basic idea? So our goal is we want to cancel the zeros. So somehow there's something forcing a 0 there and I want to cancel it out. It's a lot like when you have to reduce fractions. So for example, if you want to simplify 60 over 64, because you know, they, they share some common factors, you say, what do they have in common? I'll cancel it. So what do these numbers have in common? Of course, it's the sixes, so you get 1 fourth. 60 over 64 equals a fourth, right? You should check. It's true. <laughs> I didn't make it up. No, no, it's not quite like that. OK, yeah. Bad factoring, you know, don't do that. All right. Mathematical humor. All right. But the, the basic idea is, is you want to cancel stuff. So I want to cancel stuff here. It looks like, though, there's nothing that I can cancel right away. So there's a couple of tricks. There's essentially three tricks. One is to rewrite, and specifically, this trick is mostly fa focusing on factoring. Another trick, which we'll talk about, which doesn't apply to here, is multiply by the conjugate. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. And the last trick is to use identities. Now, this last trick is really more aimed at things involving trigonometry. So we'll have to wait till we get to things which we can handle using trigonometry. Uh, multiplying by the conjugate, this is basically based upon an old mathematical trick called multiply by 1. Because if you multiply by 1, you don't change anything. And yet, it sounds incredibly stupid, but it'll give us the right answer. So it really is profound. Uh, there's lots of ways to rewrite. Factoring is one of them. One of them, which we'll talk about probably next week or the week after, I don't remember when, is adding by 0, or adding 0 to it. Again, it doesn't sound very profound. Adding 0 sounds kind of ri ridiculous. But notice if you add 0 or you multiply by 1, you don't change any of the numbers. So in our case, let's look at this. Limit as x approaches 3, x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x squared plus x minus 12. Let's try to factor these. These are polynomials. They're quadratics. So hopefully we can factor them out. So can we factor these? polynomials. Well, I, I, I should rephrase it. I know, I know I can factor them. The real question is, can you factor them? I hope you can. 
Uh, they'll tend to be following with that factor pretty well. Does anybody know what the top one factors into? Yeah, x minus 3, x minus 1. How about the bottom one? Yeah, x plus 4 and x minus 3. Now, if you look at that, lo and behold, notice they share something in common, the x minus 3. And that x minus 3, that's what's causing our zeros. Because if I plug in x equals 3, this part over here, the x minus 1 on the top, the x plus 4 on the bottom, that's not a problem when I plug in 3. It's those darn x minus 3s, but now I have one on the top, I have one on the bottom, they factor out, cancel. So after I factored, I could cancel the zeros. These were what I call canceling off the zeros, because those were the, what's causing the zeros. Now we have another limit, x minus 1 over x plus 4. Again, this is a continuous function. We only have to worry about if the denominator is 0, but just plug in. <coughs> what do we get when we plug this in? Well, just plug in 3. 3 minus 1 over 3 plus 4. 3 minus 1 is 2. 3 plus 4 is 7. Two sevenths. And there we go. Okay, so that's an example of factoring. And usually when you have polynomials and you get 0 over 0, what's happening is essentially you always have this situation where you have some factor of x minus c, in this case x minus 3. And you just factor it out, you cancel it, and then you're ready to go. All right. Let's try another one out. Okay, so we did rewrite. How about multiply by the conjugate? So a conjugate is pretty simple. If you have a plus b, so you have two things, you add them together. What is the conjugate? Well, the conjugate is you just change the sign. Is a minus b. And similarly, if you have a minus b, the conjugate is a plus b. So if you have two things added together, just change the sign in the middle. That's all we mean when we talk about conjugate. So for instance, suppose I ask you to have a limit as x approaches 4 of the square root of x minus 2 over x minus 4. Well, we could multiply. Now here, we have to make a decision about, well, which one to be multiplied by the conjugate by. Now, why do we care about multiplying by the conjugate? Well, lo and behold, what happens if you take a plus b and you multiply by a minus b? You get a squared, and then you get minus ab plus ab, and ha ha ha, they cancel, beautiful, <laughs> minus b squared. So you get a squared minus b squared. So multiplying by the conjugate, one of the nice things is it's a useful way to get rid of square roots because now I basically am squaring things. So in this case, I think it's better to multiply by the conjugate on the top. So I want to multiply by square root of x plus 2 because if I multiply square root of x minus 2 by square root of x plus 2, what will I end up with? I'll end up with square root of x squared, which we'll call x. It's not really, but that's okay. We'll call it x. But I have a problem. Why can't I do that? Well, I've changed the limit. Now I'm taking the limit of something different. I can't just willy-nilly throw stuff in there. I have to be careful. So how do I say, well, look, if I multiply the top by square root of x plus 2, I've changed my limit. Well, I ha somehow have to balance that out. So you multiply the bottom by square root of x plus 2. So this is what I mean when you say you multiply by 1. Because if I multiply by square root of x plus 2, divide by square root of x plus 2, that's really just the same as saying I'm, I'm multiplying by 1. And I can multiply by 1, and I don't change anything at all. It's still the exact same value. OK, so that, remember when you multiply by a conjugate, you have to multiply by both top and bottom. So on the top, we'll get x minus 4. And on the bottom, we still have that x minus 4 times square root of x plus 2. 
Now I can cancel the x minus 4s, because that's what's causing my zeros. And it's the common term on both top and bottom. So I have the limit as x goes to 4 of 1 over the square root of x plus 2. All right, so there is an example of rewriting, which is, involves factoring. We did an example of multiplying by the conjugate. And we should do an example involving trigonometry. Let me see. What can I do? Da, 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 da. Da, da, da. All right. Well, I'll just give you as a challenge. We'll, we'll finish this on Monday. Limit as x goes to pi over 6. Just try this one out. You don't... 1 minus 2 sine x over 2 square root of 3 cosine x minus 3. Okay. Find the limit of this as x goes towards pi 6. And I'll give you two hints. One hint is multiply by the conjugate first. Just pick some conjugate. Second hint is to use the fact that sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. Okay, so that's your challenge for the weekend, and we'll finish this up on Monday. Have a good weekend. We're not quite done with Chapter 2, but we'll finish up Chapter 2 and start Chapter 3 on Monday.